Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so as Paul said today, I'm going to talk about the uh, striped bass industry. Um, I also represent the U.S. hybrid striped bass industry. And I'd like to just um, introduce the idea here to remind everybody that the hybrid striped bass industry began in the 1980s uh, as a replacement product for the striped bass, which had crashed as a commercial fishery. Um, and the idea was to raise hybrid striped bass because it was more economically feasible at the time. However, the target animal was really the striped bass. Um, this was uh, work by early pioneers such as Ron Hodson and uh, Reggie Harrell. And right now, the U.S. hybrid striped bass industry is a $50 million a year U.S. Um, farm gate value. Um, without belaboring details here, entire books are written on the culture of striped bass and hybrid striped bass. So technical feasibility of culturing the animals is not a problem. Uh, it's really more about market uh, and economics of raising the animals profitably. So there's really no question as to can we raise these fish? The answer is yes. Um, so to briefly summarize some major uh, components here that are considerations for raising striped bass in culture. The first is uh, when we look at earthen ponds, striped bass do not tolerate warm temperatures like their hybrid counterpart. Really, the upper thermal maximum here is about 28 degrees centigrade, and so that means earthen pond culture in the southeast U.S. is probably out. Um, the striped bass can handle these warmer culture temperatures during their first year, but once they reach year two, they do not survive uh, warmer temperatures. Um, they're a very good candidate for recirculating or flow through aquaculture because they're a relatively high value animal, and so because these uh, recirculating is a more expensive form of culture, uh, they're a good candidate for that. And however, as far as offshore culture, there's a lot of permitting issues and regulatory concerns with striped bass because it has a very complex regulatory system. Um, and so striped bass are confusing in that regard. Uh, water chemistry, uh, the bonus to striped bass is that it's urihaline. You can grow it in fresh water, salt water, marine brackish water, it doesn't matter. They drew relatively well in all types of salinity. Um, uh, they require about eight to 10 part per thousand salt prior to, during, and after handling to mitigate stress. And really, the major requirement here is that they do require hard water. Um, they don't do very well with soft water, and so 200 part per million is recommended uh, for the striped bass. And even though they're urihaline, juveniles must be a few grams before they're stocked in the marine water. Uh, typically, they're raised in fresh water during the earliest part of the, of the culture. And also, I'm going to talk now about the domestication of the striped bass and to know that even though methods of, of culture have been demonstrated for striped bass, this was using animals that were wild origin striped bass. And we've domesticated the fish now for six generations. They're more tolerant to handling, they're more tolerant to culture, and so a lot of these studies need to be revisited um, because we believe the animals will grow better and at higher densities. Um, the striped bass is one of the priority species for the National Animal Genome Program, the NRSP8. Uh, the genome for the striped bass has been sequenced. Um, also, there is a national breeding program for the striped bass. Um, that I coordinate with Adam Fuller from the USDA ARS, and also we involve the U.S. hybrid striped bass industry in this, and we disseminate fish currently to the U.S. hybrid striped bass industry. Um, the striped bass genome is publicly available. You can download it from NCBI. Uh, uh, Linnea, uh, my graduate student Linnea Anderson and Jason Abernathy from USDA ARS are going to present this next door in about a half an hour, uh, the striped bass and white bass genomes, which we've completed to 24 linkage group resolution, which is a very good tool for selective breeding and also research on the animals. Um, Andy McGinty, uh, Adam Fuller, and I run the national breeding program for the U.S. hybrid striped bass industry. We have sixth generation domestic striped bass, tenth generation domestic white bass, these are available uh, to the industry primarily for use to produce hybrid striped bass uh, uh, by farmers across the country. However, nothing stops us from using this domesticated animal uh, to supply a domestic striped bass industry as well. So if you're interested, uh, please contact Andy McGinty. Anyone who's tried to get a hold of me is very difficult, so I apologize. This is not a new concept. Uh, Eric Hallerman back in 1994, this is a good paper talking about economic feasibility of establishing a domestic breeding program for, for uh, striped bass. And so this goes back 20 or more years, uh, including Ron, work by Ron Hodson, Curry Woods, and also my advisor, Craig Sullivan. Uh, to give you a background, the domestic striped bass is based on about 400 founder crosses of striped bass representing uh, gen uh, geographic lineages across the Atlantic U.S. seaboard, including uh, Florida Gulf of Mexico. These fish were all collapsed into one gen uh, genetically homogenous broodstock, 
We raise four year classes um, every year of striped bass, age one, two, three, and four. And we start off with thousands of fingerlings. We try to make about a hundred or so different distinct families each year. Um, and we cross then males and females and then provide animals then also to the industry for these hybrid crosses. So we've got several hundred families on the station. Um, and we try to make a hundred each year. Um, technology for sperm cryopreservation has also been reported. Um, we've also stored germplasm at the USDA Animal Germplasm Research, uh, Repository. These are the equivalent of second and third generation domesticated striped bass, so we need to get a more updated sample in there from the sixth generation domesticated stripers. And again, this is mostly work done by Curry Woods. So we've got sperm cryopreservation protocols established. Recently, we've developed methods to spawn striped bass in mass where we don't use any hormones at all, and we can produce millions of fry. Um, we, we usually batch what we call batch spawn, 20 or more of each gender in large tanks, and then just harvest the eggs out. So we've, we've eliminated strip spawning. We've also eliminated the use of HCG and GNRH. And this is data that I presented uh, the last year or the year before here at this meeting. We also have genotyped the animals, and we find that there's very good genetic mixing here. The, the animals are quite promiscuous. Uh, males and females will, will reproduce with several of each gender. Um, with this last year, 2018, we produced about 16 million fry, again, eliminating the use of GNRH analog and also HCG. So 16 million fry produced in 2018 uh, using these no hormone group spawns, and we're currently working to get this, these data published. Um, I'm now going to move into selective breeding for particular traits. These are several of the traits that we've been breeding for over the last, say, 20 years. Uh, this complete list is published here uh, in this book edited by Hamping Wong, but I'm going to talk here about smaller head size with improved dress out weight and also faster growth with improved feed efficiency. So David Berlinski up at University of New Hampshire compared the domestic striped bass with several strange and wild origin striped bass. The domestic striped bass and, and, and wild origin Florida fish actually perform the best. We can get a, a three pound fish within about 17 months at uh, marine conditions at 20 to 21 degrees centigrade, RAS, and we can get a five pound fish in about 24 months. Um, so the domestic fish do very well in culture of, in RAS conditions. We replicated this study in North Carolina State University, again in RAS, but this was at uh, close to fresh water, so five part per thousand or less. And again, we can achieve a three pound fish here in about 500 days. Um, Curry Woods and David Berlinski also compared feed uh, conversion ratio of striped bass in different salinities, so marine, freshwater, and brackish water. We can see significantly better feed conversion uh, ratio of the domesticated fish compared to wild origin fish from Virginia, Florida, and Canada. Uh, and so even though the Florida fish might grow as well as the domestic striped bass in culture, we see a much improved feed conversion ratio in the domestic animals. And these data were also presented in 2016 Aquaculture America. So when we look at improving dress out weight, we've been breeding for smaller head size. So up here is a, a wild striped bass. Note the size of the gape of the mouth here and the length of the head versus the domestic striped bass. It's got a much smaller head. Um, this improves the uh, dress out weight of the filet. So we're working with a, a local seafood, which is a seafood distributor located in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and they process wild striped bass because it's a fishery in the state of North Carolina along with our domesticated fish. This is an example of one of our processed fillets here, um, processed by local seafood. And also we work with chefs and restaurants around the Raleigh-Durham area. Um, and so the, the striped bass are processed here and we also um, poll the chefs to find out information such as what is the desired product size, like what size fish do they want. Uh, this restaurant here was recently voted uh, best restaurant in the Raleigh-Durham area. Maybe it's because of the delicious striped bass they serve, I'm not sure. I, I, can't, I can't say that for sure. So things we found is this. The preferred market size is a three to six pound fish. All right, the restaurant chefs want this. Um, this is for a skin on filet, rib out, and this is some uh, seafood filets here from local seafood in the Raleigh Farmer's Market. Retail here this last summer was $18 a pound for that. Um, and again, they process all sorts of wild fish along with our domestics, and so we can say that our what we call domestic mediums have about a half a percent better fillet dress out yield, and our large fish have about a four percent better fillet dress out yield. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that um, the fish are commercially harvested during the spawning run, and so females have a large gonad at that time. So there's a lot of row there. Um, and 
We've also assumed we're trying to figure out what the farm gate value would be for this. You know, the high risk drive bass industry, we're looking at about a $3.85 per pound farm gate value. However, striped bass are probably going to be able to fetch $5 or more a pound based upon our, our work here and our preliminary uh, experiments there. So you can buy frozen farm-raised striped bass fillets of Whole Foods. Uh, Love the Wild distributes these fish, and so this is the product labeling for this. And so as far as the size of the market, it's pretty large. So these, these are currently available at Whole Foods, farm-raised striped bass. Um, and when we look at uh, a few other considerations for striped bass, I'd like to point out policy and permitting. So when we look at the NOAA um, Gulf of Mexico uh, Offshore Cage Mariculture Initiative, striped bass are not, it's not legal to culture striped bass in this situation as far as I'm concerned, right, or as far as I know right now. So it's been accidentally omitted and so it's, no, it's not a candidate for this, which then leaves uh, uh, permitting then for Atlantic Eastern U.S. aquaculture offshore and there's considerations with that as well as far as the sport fishery and possession of striped bass and offshore. Um, it's a consideration here and so there needs, this needs to be figured out before we really can pursue this with striped bass. Um, this uh, recent uh, Aqua Act introduced by Senator Wicker, we'll see what, what goes on with that, but this is also uh, working towards the, that direction of, of helping this out. So that leaves us then with recirculating aquaculture, which is where our efforts have been di directed because of the uncertainty here with offshore. And this is a newspaper article from, two, from, from January of this year. This is a farm in Connecticut that's raising Dyson Trarchus labrax, the European sea bass. Now this is a non-native fish, but it's in family Moronidae. It is a striped bass, it's just a European version of it. And so this indicates then that, that RAS, or RAS culture of striped bass is, is, is very possible. When we look at disease incidence in striped bass, really other than opportunistic pathogens, we're looking at VHS, viral hemorrhagic septicemia. This was a big deal 10 or more years ago, um, and it's really located here around the Great Lakes region. It really, I haven't heard much about it uh, for several years, and our advice here, we've got domesticated fish, come to us, don't get them from Lake Michigan or Lake Erie, right? So come get our fish. And so with that, I'd like to show our collaborations here. We work directly with USDA ARS, uh, Carl Webster is the director of the Harry K. Priest Stuttgart National Aquaculture Research Center. Adam Fuller and Jason Abernathy are the geneticists and the physiologists here who work on the hybrid striped bass industry, again, with striped bass. And then Andy McGinty and myself run the uh, domesticated breeding program here at North Carolina State University. And also we have facilities here for uh, doing larval rearing and, um, uh, studies. And I'm not going to go over these, this bulleted list, but this is provided in the abstracts. It's a, it's a list of strengths and weaknesses for the, the striped bass that um, is sort of a summary of what we've gone over here. And just to point out that we are sort of looking at intensive larval rearing of striped bass with USDA and SRAC. And I'd like to encourage everybody to promote and not permit the aquaculture industry. I think this is an important concept. We can't just say we can do this. We want to say we will do this. Um, and so with that, these are my um, co-authors, colleagues, and research collaborators uh, in particular, Harry Daniels, Russell Borsky, Steve Hall, uh, Ron Hodson, of course, is still involved with this, uh, Curry Woods and David Berlinski, um, and then my uh, stakeholders and funding support for the striped bass and uh, hybrid striped bass industry in the U.S. So with that, I'll entertain questions if I've got time, Paul. Thank you. <laughs>